Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that convict Ironjaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That that is. Way. Blank is the killer. Hello and welcome to Blank is the Killer, the unoriginal horror movie podcast where I, you're totally not a B-girl, Josh Baker, covers six new-to-me horror movies with a random spooky topic seven at the end. This episode includes Fatal Banging, Horror Hills, and Twisted Reality. Come on a long car ride with me to meet my folks. We can talk about horror movies on the way. Number one, Invasion of the Bee Girls, 1973, directed by Dennis Sanders. Men are dropping dead due to what appears to be strenuous banging induced heart attacks. Neil from State Security comes into town to check out the mysterious deaths. Bee Girls are behind it. They're killing men and making more Bee Girls. Neil eventually figures this out and interrupts the Bee Girls as they are doing the transformation process on his kind of girlfriend, Julie. Neil shoots one piece of equipment which causes a chain reaction that kills all the bee girls. Later on, Neil and Julie start banging. Julie may or may not have been successfully turned into a bee girl. Bee girls are the killers. What an unbelievable plot. Invasion of the Bee Girls, which I'll just call bee girls from now on, is something. Men are dying from sex. What do we do? Here's an idea. Let's stop having sex for the time being. Wh what? Are you kidding me? I need to get my bone on. How will we survive without making whoopee? This is something that is brought up in the movie. Sex equals death, therefore let's hold off on banging for two seconds. Makes sense to me, but the town was not having that idea. Hours after the no sex idea was brought up, all the men in the town's horniness rose to dangerous, go out into the streets and assault women levels. Yeah, a group of guys attempt to force themselves on Julie hours after being told men are dying during sex. Can't even dissuade these rapists with death. The man that instantly blows back against the no sex idea is the man that looks least likely to actually have any. I believe we learn that Mr. Mad About Abstinence is actually gay and is with a nice teacher dude. Mr. Mad still sleeps with ladies at times, so he's killed by a b-girl. Teacher dude, who I'm 100% sure was gay, also dies after banging a b-girl. Weird. Why even have gay characters if they meet their demise by b-girl seduction? From the get-go, it's obvious that something weird is happening. A bunch of women are cosplaying as Corey Hart. They're wearing sunglasses at night and also indoors. If I showed up to an emergency town hall meeting and more than one person was wearing sunglasses indoors during it, I'd think the shade wearers were up to no good. The sunglasses are surprisingly never called out. I'm not even really sure why the B-Girls wear them. During intercourse, B-Girl eyes turn fully black. Okay, don't want people seeing that. Sure. Thing is, their eyes appear to be normal at other times. I don't think B eyes are extra sensitive to light or anything. We're introduced to a couple that hates each other. The husband thinks his wife is a real B. Later on, she puts the moves on him, and even though he knows men are dying in weird sexual situations, and that his wife wouldn't entertain the idea before the strange death started, he doesn't even consider not accepting her advances. Your wife's a literal bee now, mister. Given that the plot revolves around bee girls banging dudes to death, there are multiple sex scenes in the movie. 
The longest and most uncomfortable one involves an old professor. We see almost every painstaking moment of the professor and B-girl copulation, including this old dude stripping. On the B-girls poster, the B-girls are wearing Fifth Element-esque costumes. These costumes aren't in the movie. In the movie, the B-girl uniform is a lab coat with nothing underneath. How is a B-girl made, you might be asking? That's easy. A woman is pricked with the golden bee pin, then she's shot with the pleasure laser. After that, she's covered in the ceremonial goo, which may or may not have been collected from victims. Once slathered, the inductee is placed in the bee box, where bees swarm her and completely cover her body. To complete the transformation, all the bee girls are then zapped with the pleasure laser once more. Voila! It seems pretty straightforward. I guess B-Girls is a prequel to Orgasmo. All of the acting in B-Girls is hamtastic. The special effects include full eye contacts and a bit of pyrotechnics. Is it incredibly stupid that the B-Girls' plan is foiled after one dude comes into their completely unlocked lair and plants a bullet in one machine that somehow causes a chain reaction of B-Girl death? Oh yeah. The ending is absolutely bananas. Should main dude Neil have gotten Julie blood tested for B-Girl before jumping her bones at the end? Probably. Did I enjoy the dead bodies that were just guys covered in some pale makeup making dumb shocked O faces? <laughs> yeah. The Invasion of the B-Girls is a dumb movie that can be fun with some friends. Don't worry, the sex scenes are so awkward that it won't make it weird. Number 2, Lose, 2018, directed by Tillman Singer. A girl named Lose accidentally summoned a demon while attending a religious school. Years later, the demon kills some people and catches up to her. Lose is then possessed by the demon. The demon is the killer. I recall watching a trailer for Lose some time ago. The trailer didn't grab my attention. My journey with Lose probably should have stopped there, but I saw people praising the movie online and decided to give it a chance. Lose is a low-budget, experimental film created as part of a student thesis. Not much happens during Lose, and what does is purposefully confusing. There's a character from Lose's school days that was at the ritual where Lose summoned a demon, which I'm assuming possessed the pregnant girl who was at the center of the ritual, but the old classmate isn't supposed to be the pregnant girl, but also seems to have been the pregnant girl. The pregnant girl was found dead, so my understanding is that the pregnant girl was possessed. The demon then moved on from the pregnant girl and possessed the old classmate, which left the pregnant girl dead. This theory is given weight by the old classmate dying once the demon leaves her body and enters the doctor, who goes on to hypnotize Luz. It doesn't really matter. Luz cares a lot more about atmosphere and style over a cohesive plot. Even though as a whole I don't care for Luz, there is a very intriguing and well done hypnotism sequence. Luz is hypnotized by the possessed doctor. We then see Luz act out what happened while she was working as a taxi driver and picked up the old classmate. It's a very unique and well done sequence. It's a brilliant way to keep the budget of the film down while still adding artistic merit. I really enjoyed the hypnotism. The acting is all over the place. I found Julia Riedler, who played the possessed old classmates acting horrendous. Normally when a movie is in another language other than English, it's harder for me to tell if someone's acting is off or if it's just that I don't understand the language, but the mediocrity of the performance shown through the language barrier. The doctor was played by Jan Bluthart, and he does a decent job. He's definitely the strongest actor. Luz was played by Luana Belize. She was fine, but the movie definitely would have benefited from a stronger lead. The camera work and sound design are a definite strength of Luz. The sound design is what truly makes the hypnotism sequence masterful. There's a lot of interesting framing. If Luz has one thing going for it, it's the aesthetic. If you try to make sense of the plot, you'll be at a loss. So the demon possesses the old classmate to get close to Luz. After Luz becomes aware of this, she bails out of the taxi they're in. 
Now the demon knows somehow that Luz is in custody and a specific doctor will be brought in to check on her. Why does the demon end up possessing the doctor instead of the cop who apprehends Luz? Why did the demon possess a new body at all when the demon is shown to be able to control bodies it's not in? The doctor demon puts the cop under its thrall. I know that I am just attacking the plot here, but a sensible plot is important when it comes to my enjoyment of a film. The plot can be loose and weird like in The Lighthouse, but the plot at least needs some solid bones. You can't just make a movie that's pretty and get a pass. Lose is only 70 minutes, I dig shorter movies. It's a problem if I'm looking at the clock multiple times throughout your 70 minute movie because it's dragging on. Nothing in Lose ever pulled me in after the bar scene with the old classmate and the doctor. I never felt a strong investment in the characters or what was going on. I could see Lose being an amazing short film centered around the hypnotism sequence, but as a whole, Lose didn't work for me. If you are a fan of minimalist, experimental movies that aren't driven by plot, consider checking out Lose. For everyone else, this is a loser and a big skip. Number 3, Get Duked. 2019, directed by Ninian Doff. Three troublemakers, DJ, Duncan, and Dean, and a homeschooler named Ian head to the Highlands to earn a wilderness award. While on their journey, they encounter a mysterious masked killer that looks like the Duke of Edinburgh. After burning the Duke's leg and escaping the maniac, the boys meet up with their teacher at a campsite. The teacher has a burnt leg, so Duncan runs him over, thinking he's the killer. The boys then put the body in a van that rolls off. The Duke, who's obviously not the teacher, is still alive and now accompanied by his wife. Ian hurts his leg and is left behind. DJ hangs out with some farmers while Duncan and Dean take shelter in a cave. The troublemakers rescue Ian from the killers and chase them. After cornering the masked oldsters, more masked oldsters show up to save them. They gather for a picture and end up being crushed by the van the teacher was left in. The teacher is still alive. The masked duke wannabes are the killers. I'm assuming the main two we see fail to kill anyone. But the other old masked people say they had a good time killing. Duncan almost made the list, but the teacher somehow survived. The original title for Get Duked was Boys in the Wood. I couldn't find a reason for the change, but I think it was a good idea to change the title since the boys are never in the woods. Get Duke took some time to really get in a groove. The pacing is a bit all over the place. When the troubled teens save Ian, it does feel like the climax, but there's an entire fourth of the movie left. That being said, I did enjoy quite a bit of Get Duked. Did I hate the Deus Ex Machina at the end? Nope. The van coming back into play to crush the evil oldsters was hilarious. The best character in the movie by far is Duncan, who's played by Louis Gribbon. Gribbon's comedic delivery and timing are everything. I'd go as far to say that he single-handedly makes this movie worth seeing. He's supposed to be the dumbest member of the group, but his ill-thought-out plans consistently save the day. Mostly by luck, but they work. I'd say the weakest part of the movie are the villains. Eddie Izzard plays the main duke and his performance is subdued. The deadly dukes should be cartoony and overacted, but instead they are muted and boring. Why hire a known funny man if you aren't going to capitalize on his strengths? Back to the boys. DJ is played by Varanj Juneja. He does alright, but I don't really find the fake gangster character funny anymore. That's not his fault. Dean is played by Ryan Gordon. I liked him quite a bit. I had to put on subtitles solely because of him. There's a cop side story where the police are investigating what's happening in the Highlands, as well as a big case about a bread thief. Most of the cop comedy fell flat. The funniest cop moments centered around the whole bread thief situation. The gist of that being, someone has been stealing all of the bread in the community. All of it. It's the kind of absurdity I really enjoy. There's a recurring bit about Duncan having a fork that's proper sharp that landed every time it was brought up. 
I almost forgot to bring up Ian. Ian's a boring character. He's overshadowed by all the other characters. Samuel Bottomley played Ian. His acting is fine, but I needed way more from the character. There's a lot you can do with a homeschooled, socially awkward kid that is forced into a group of delinquents. Ian's character trait is adding and erasing check marks on a laminate over and over. It's a little humorous the first time, but quickly becomes annoying. DJ being a hit with the farmers was a nice addition and expectation subverter. I could have done without the hallucinogenic rabbit dookie, but the computer effects work for the tripping was fun to look at. Like the Highland Hills, Get Duked has its ups and downs, but it's overall an enjoyable watch. If you already have Amazon Prime, you can check out the movie right now without spending any additional moolah. I was surprised that most of the rap in the movie was American. I think there was only like maybe one British rap song and it was the worst one. Number 4, Slugs, 1988, directed by J.P. Simone. Bad toxic waste management has birthed a new type of carnivorous slug. People start dying mysteriously. A health inspector named Mike is on the case. He figures out slugs are the culprit and teams up with a scientist and sanitation worker to blow up the slugs. Mike and the sanitation worker go into the sewers to find the slugs and the scientist pumps chemicals where the slugs are concentrated. The sanitation worker dies during the mission, but the slugs are defeated. Except one slug survives, which is enough for the slugs to start over. The slugs are the killers. Slugs. A movie where only three characters aren't awkwardly dubbed over. Unlike an older Italian movie, Slugs had everyone speak lines in English, but then dubbed over actors who I'm assuming had a Spanish accent. That's right, Slugs is a Spanish-American movie. I guess American audiences wouldn't have been into a movie where slugs attack a rural town in Spain. Turns out American audiences weren't going to see slugs in theaters anyway. The dubbing is very distracting and ruins any chance of the dub characters acting being good. Not to say that the non-dubbed actors are great or anything. Pretty much all the acting is bad. My favorite bad actor is Santiago Alvarez, who plays the scientist. He's dubbed by a British dude and ends everything he says with a huge grin. Michael Garfield played Mike, the protagonist. Mike has no charisma and is almost always on screen when there's a lull in Slugs. When Mike isn't trying his best to put the audience to sleep, Slugs is filled with phenomenal practical effects that are stupidly fun. You have an old man chop off his slug bitten hand, a face explosion, a chest explosion, a blood spurting ankle slug bite, a naked lady covered in hungry slugs that chew out her eye from its socket. The practical effects are where it's at. The people credited for the effects are Gonzalo Gonzalo, Basilio Cortijo, and Carlos de Marchis, and they won a Goya award for them. Their work is the reason why I am not immediately writing off slugs. I think slugs would have worked better as a 75 minute film. There are easily 15 minutes of Mike that can be cut out with nothing of value being lost. Almost pet warning! A hamster is attacked by a slug. The little furball ends up covered in blood. You assume the poor fellow met his demise, but right after being shown near death, the hamster is shown in the background of a shot, slug free, happy as can be. It's definitely a continuity issue, but since I like the hamster, the hamster lived in my head cannon. We learn that the slugs have been eating animals, but that's not enough for an official pet warning. Surprisingly, there are a ton of dogs in the movie, and none of them are eaten on screen by slugs. Kudos for not having the slugs munch on the pooches. In the act of blowing up the slugs with chemicals, I'm assuming Mike and his pals also killed a bunch of civilians. The sewers did not contain the explosions. Houses explode. I'm not going to put the blame on the sanitation guy since he pointlessly sacrificed himself during the slug mission that for no reason became the slug suicide mission, 
but Mike and scientists are responsible for all the people that must have died in the explosions. Why am I saying the sanitation guy died for no reason? After he dies, Mike shows that both of them could have easily used a pipe to get to a ladder to leave the sewers. For the most part, real slugs were used in the movie. The slugs look amazing all the way up until Mike enters the sewer. Fake slugs must have been used during some of the attack scenes, which looked good enough for me not to bother pointing them out. Besides this one with teeth. But in the sewers, I guess they ran out of real and fake slugs since terrible rubber slugs that looked almost exactly like those fake worms you can buy for fishing were thrown all over the place. Slugs lives up to its title and has some amazing special effects sequences where slugs eat people. The biggest problem with the movie is no charisma Mike. It's still worth checking out if you're looking for a silly creature feature. Number 5, Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, 2000, directed by Joe Berlinger. After the success of the Blair Witch movie, a native of the town it was set in named Jeffrey is doing what he can to profit off the film. He takes a research couple, Stephen and Tristan, a practicing Wiccan named Erica, and a goth named Kim on a tour into the woods. They are confronted by another tour group, but talk the other group into checking out a different location. Jeff's group wakes up to find all their stuff destroyed except for the tapes from Jeff's cameras with no memory of what happened. Tristan has a miscarriage. Everyone goes to Jeff's to try and figure out what happened. Supernatural events take place. Erica is found dead and the tapes show the group ritualistically killing the other tour group at the behest of Tristan, who appeared to be possessed by the Blair Witch. Possessed Tristan is killed by Steven. Jeff, Kim, and Steven are arrested. The cops have tapes that show all of them killing people, which doesn't line up with how they remember things. Jeff, Kim, Steven, and Erica, at the command of the Blair Witch, are the killers. Unless it's a mass hysteria thing and there just happened to be a group of that many people that were down to clown with murder. The Blair Witch Project is easily one of the best horror movies ever made. Book of Shadows Blair Witch 2, which I'll shorten to Blair 2, is puzzling. Why was this made? Well, that's easy enough to answer. Money. Was there any other reason, an artistic vision or a drive to continue the story? Joe Berlinger, who directed and was half the writing team, might believe so, but I don't. Who's Joe Berlinger? What other movies did this dude have a hand in before he was handed the reins to Blair 2? I can say with certainty that unless you're a big documentary fan, you have not seen or heard of anything else this man has done before Blair 2. That's right, the director of Blair 2 is a documentary filmmaker through and through. That isn't inherently a bad thing. If I was tasked with creating a sequel to something like The Blair Witch, making another cursed documentary sounds like the play. It might be the only play. A documentary filmmaker was hired, so in an alternate timeline, Joe did the impossible and created a highly regarded horror documentary follow-up to The Blair Witch that wasn't derivative. Unfortunately, we're in the bad timeline where he made a film that completely missed why the original was successful. It felt real, it was simple, it had amazing acting. Currently, I'm having trouble with the idea that Blair 2 wasn't purposefully made as an over-the-top horror comedy. You have goofy over-the-top characters like a douchey local, obnoxious Wiccan, stereotypical goth, and a cartoon sheriff. All of the horror events come off as humorous, like the weird little girl that walks backwards while jittering around like an inflatable man outside of a car wash, and the creepy old-timey clothes-wearing kids that cause Kim to slowly and meticulously drive a van into a tree. The group's naked when they ambush and massacre the other tourist group. During serious conversations, songs like Rob Zombie's Dragula can be heard playing softly in the background. In other scenes, the late 90s and year 2000 score is front and center. I would like to list some bands included. 
the aforementioned Rob Zombie, System of a Down, Marilyn Manson, and Queens of the Stone Age. I enjoy all of those acts. Do I expect them to show up in a sequel to The Blair Witch? No. The acting in Blair 2 is a laugh riot. The only person that does a decent job is Tristine Schuyler, who played Tristan. I don't even think she was that great, but everyone else is so over the top and awkward that Schuyler's performance is fantastic by comparison. I knew that when I saw Mr. Byrne notice himself, Jeffrey Donovan, that I was going to be in for a wild ride. The worst acting in Blair 2 award goes to Erica Learson, but she was given complete garbage to work with. I don't know if anyone can pull off the obnoxious Wiccan character. There is another amazing actor who understood that Blair 2 was made as a horror comedy, Lanny Flaherty. He's hilarious as the cartoon sheriff. I loved when he called Jeff on the phone to talk about the dead Taurus. During the conversation, he yells, Disembowel, Jeffrey. He then appears on the news while talking to Jeff on the phone. It's great. His character is really funny, and I enjoyed all of his screen time. The editing? Sure, I can talk about the There's a giant whale eating a corn dog. Editing? A little bit. It's what you'd call spooky noises and a ghost. Stop interrupting me with random pointless crap. Cut directly into what I'm saying. Jeez. There's out of place scenes that pop up throughout Blair 2. The editing when that's not happening is still all over the place and chaotic. Tons of quick cuts. It's a mess. How are the effects? The gore effects for the other tour group murdering are passable but nothing special i actually dug the creepy makeup that was done for the backward dancing girl but the silliness of the reversed grooving made it impossible to be truly spooked by her unsettling appearance i highly recommend watching book of shadows blair witch 2 as a straight up horror comedy it's an unintentionally hilarious time capsule of the year 2000 and a monument to Hollywood's arrogance. The studio didn't like what Joe Berlinger turned in and changed a bunch of stuff, but based on what I saw, I don't think there was any way to edit Blair 2 into a sequel that deserved to be related to the original. Number 6, I Am Thinking of Ending Things, 2020, directed by Charlie Kaufman. A woman is riding with her boyfriend, Jake, to his parents' house to meet them. She's thinking of ending things. A high school janitor going about his life is interspersed. Once the woman and Jake make it to his parents, they have a very strange dinner where time seems to keep passing. The woman and Jake get back on the road. They stop for ice cream, then head to a high school to throw away the cups as things become more and more surreal. The woman runs into the janitor and tells him that she doesn't remember Jake at all since he was just some creep who stared at her. A ballet version of the janitor kills a ballet version of Jake. The janitor decides to kill himself. Jake then accepts an award and sings a song from Oklahoma. The janitor is Jake and the woman. No one is the killer. While perusing online forums, I came across the topic of best horror books. One of the most brought up books in the replies was I'm Thinking of Ending Things. I've had House of Leaves for over a year and it's been sitting in a drawer with a bookmark about 30 pages in ever since. Obviously I was never going to read I'm Thinking of Ending Things myself, so I hopped over to its Wikipedia page and checked out the full plot summary. A book about a man reminiscing about what could have been while deciding whether or not he's going to end it all sounds intriguing. I kind of wish I had read it myself. A short while after reading the summary, the Netflix adaptation was released. Until I explicitly bring up the book again, I'll be referring to the movie from now on. I did not enjoy I'm Thinking of Ending Things. I found it overtly pretentious and masturbatory. It's Ready Player One for people that think they're smarter than everyone else, meaning both are chock full of references, but ending things are more highbrow. At least with Ready Player One, I didn't need to know all of the references to understand the plot. 
One's enjoyment of a standalone film should not hinge on their knowledge of the book it's based on, the writer-director's past work, or things that are referenced in the film. For example, I heavily enjoyed the movie Airplane, even though I didn't know all the things it was parodying. Another example would be the ship in the movie Triangle. The ship is called the Sisyphus. The movie is about a never-ending time loop. Sisyphus was punished by the gods with the chore of pushing a boulder up a hill that would roll back to the bottom every time he'd get close to the top. I didn't need to know who Sisyphus was to understand what was happening in Triangle. Ending things leaned heavily on me knowing all about the musical Oklahoma for context. I don't know anything about that musical. Ending things was captivating and dread-inducing up until the woman and Jake got back on the road. I found the interactions with Jake's inexplicably aging parents intriguing. All of the performances are spectacular. Tony Collette and David Thewlis are wonderful as Jake's parents. The special effects makeup done to age them is some of the best I've ever seen. Jesse Plemons is a great Jake. I'm surprised they didn't apply prosthetics to him and have him also play the janitor version of himself given how great the aging on Colette and Thulis was handled. Jesse Buckley's performance is compelling as the woman. The biggest problem I had with ending things is how quickly it's revealed that what's happening isn't real. I stopped fearing for the woman's safety and was put at ease once it was obvious that nothing that was happening was set in reality. To bring back the book, I saw people that had both read the book and watched the movie bring up the fact that the woman is kept a character that feels very real up until the reveal that her and Jake are one. The ending of the book is very different from the film. The book has the woman realize that she is part of Jake after running away and hiding from the janitor and eventually being found. Janitor Jake then says he's thinking of ending things, which leads to the woman killing herself. I'm not completely sure, but I don't think there is a prolonged ballet sequence in the book. The runtime for ending things is over two hours. I believe the second car ride could easily be cut down to help with the pacing of the last third of the movie. I still didn't find the ending of the film to be satisfying in any way. I'm thinking of ending things is a frustrating watch that never capitalizes on the dread and eeriness that the initial car ride and family dinner creates. I recommend reading the book instead. I now feel compelled to read it myself. Number 7. R.I.P. Hulark. 2018 to 2020. You don't know what you had until it's gone. I've, I've ranted about how terrible Hulu Into the Dark installments are for two years now. Sure, some of the movies released in the series have been okay, but for the most part, Hulark movies were garbage. I never thought I'd miss something that was almost always bad. Due to the pandemic, the August installment of Hulark was never completed. It was the first month since Hulark debuted in October 2018 that didn't have a new, most likely terrible Hulu Into the Dark installment. Why do I miss a series that had multiple entries on my worst of the year lists? Looking back, Hulark had become a dear friend. A stupid and, most of the time, annoying friend, but a friend nonetheless. I could count on Hulark to come out with something new and, well, I was going to say fresh, but that's not true, so just something new for me to watch every month. I heavily enjoyed making fun of most Hulark movies and being pleasantly surprised by a few. I wish I could have written a better eulogy for you, Hulark. You terrible, yet endearing trash fire. I hope one day you will rise from the ashes at the bottom of the dumpster and grace my eyes with more laughably awful movies in the future. Until then, rest in peace. Hulu Into the Dark. That's a wrap on Blank is the Killer 79, Fatal Banging, Horror Hills, and Twisted Reality. If you liked what you heard from me, consider leaving a rating on iTunes. 
Remember those garbage men, the Basuda boys? They're back in action. Check out their podcast, but be sure to listen to them with no one else around, like when you're listening to Mindless Self-Indulgence these days. Episode 80 will be out on September 20th. Until then, make sure to keep your clothes on if you decide to tour the forest where the Blair Witch is said to hang out.